That's how we greet people in Texas, where I'm from. We make up lots of words in Texas, like y'all, fixin' to. So I'm fixin' to talk to y'all about building compassionate machines. Now, we're starting to turn a lot of our lives over to technology. And there are a lot of fears about us all turning into robots and our jobs being taken away by robots. But instead of us turning into robots, I think we'd all prefer if we could turn robots more like us. So how do we make these machines more human? That's what I want to talk to you about today. But it turns out that we humans are flawed. I know it's hard to believe. We have lots of opinions, and we hold these opinions as fact. In our minds, in these thick heads of ours, we believe these opinions often to be true. How many times have you guys been out drinking with your buddies, and you're talking about politics, and they say something, they're like, this is absolutely how it is. And you sit there and nod and smile, but in your head, you're like, that's so not true. Now, machines have this uncanny ability to take those opinions and exponentially multiply their impact as fact out to millions and even billions of people. We call this algorithmic bias. Now, bias has a mathematically specific definition when it comes to machine learning. And it means there's an error in estimation or there's an over or under representation of a sampling group. And the algorithms certainly are taking those biases and, and working those out in machine form. There are, you know, I guess to say it's put it in kind of non-mathematical terms, it's basically widening the gap between the haves and have-nots. And this can have some pretty significant social and economic impacts. For the purposes of today, I'm going to focus on two types of, of impacts from these, from these biases. The first is allocative harm. So allocative harm is when certain groups see or don't see resources based on who they are. An example of this would be um, research that shows that if your gender is set to female, your experience on the, on the internet will actually see fewer ads for high paying jobs. So if we take Jane and her experience in looking for a job, she's less likely to even know that these jobs exist, which means she's less likely to apply for these jobs which means over time she's going to gain less, less relevant experience than John, her counterpart. And ultimately, Jane becomes significantly less employable. The second type of harm is representation harm. And this is when technology reinforces stereotypes that we already have. There was a Harvard research professor who found that when you entered in a search term for a black sounding name, these were her words, not mine, uh, names like Trevon or Latanya, when you entered in these names, you were 20% more likely to see content around uh, criminally related ads. So things like, have you ever been arrested? Now imagine if you're going to a business meeting, you're typing in the name of the person you're about to meet with because you want to do a little bit of background research, and up pops these ads right next to your search results. This has a very subconscious effect on the way that we perceive these results. So we know this happens. We know there are, there are concerns when it comes to algorithmic bias. But why should you care? Well, I had the same question. I'd heard a lot about this stuff. I'm like, yeah, that really stinks. 
That's not cool. And prior to Alice, I started two other companies. Uh, the first was a failed attempt at entrepreneurship. If y'all are interested in hearing about that, just look up my TED talk. I talk about it in detail. The second was a much more successful company. And what I learned through these two experiences was that all of these opportunities existed for entrepreneurs. But they didn't open up to me until after I had succeeded. I worked hard with that first company. I knocked on doors, I talked to people, I did everything I could possibly do, but I had no idea that this whole world existed to support entrepreneurs. I was living in my own separated bubble. And as soon as I succeeded, people started reaching out and inviting me to conferences, and I got invited to Fortune Most Powerful Women, and these great summits, and all these wonderful things. And this network was exposed to me, and I was like, if I had had this at day one, how incredibly powerful would that have been? It was allocative harm in human form. And so when we started Alice, our goal was to open up this world of entrepreneurship and all the resources that supported it to every single founder, regardless of who they were or where they came from or what their past experiences were. If you go to helloalice.com, you can sign up for free. There's no cost to it. And the goal is that every single founder, male, female, non-binary, black, white, every beautiful shade in between, people with disabilities, people without, can find the resources that are relevant to them and, and find a personalized roadmap through entrepreneurship. Now you can imagine, given that we had this focus on inclusivity and diversity, it was very important that we didn't fall prey to these algorithmic biases, that we didn't create and perpetuate these very biases that existed. So, as we did this and started digging into it, we realized that even today, algorithms are dictating much of our future. In the same way that I gave the example with Jane and her job search, we're already seeing a very filtered version of the internet. Whether that's our experience on Facebook and in the feeds that we see, whether that's our experience in our search results. As a Latina woman in Houston, what I'm seeing on the internet is very different than what many of you see. But also my desires to perceive that internet are very different the words that I respond to, the visual imagery that resonates with me, it becomes not only an issue of algorithms, but also a question of UI. So we learned that bias is a really, really sneaky thing when it comes to technology. It isn't always clearly apparent, and so we started looking at some testing. So here's an example of a profile that we rolled out on Alice. And if you can see that button there, it says, get connected. We thought this was a pretty simple thing. The idea was that you can click on somebody's profile, click the get connected button, and you could connect. Pretty straightforward, right? That's what we thought. And we realized that nobody was clicking on these. Um, it wasn't getting a lot of activity. And most of our user base at the time was female. And so we sat down with some users, and we do 100% of our user testing on women, minorities, and underserved populations. And we found that they were really intimidated by this button. Like, I'm not gonna click on somebody's profile who I feel like has more experience than me, who has a lot of influence. I feel like I'm gonna be bothering them. Like, they're busy, they're time constrained. I don't wanna pester them. And so they were holding themselves back from clicking on a button that they actually, to a person who they actually wanted to get connected with. And so we played with some different options and ultimately landed on this button. Alice, introduce me. It turns out humans are really conditioned to ask machines for things. We have absolutely no concern asking a machine to do something for us. We also added a little text underneath that says basically this user is just going to be notified that you're interested in a connection. And we saw engagement with that button ramp up significantly. So we learned through that process that the words we use, whether we refer to somebody as an entrepreneur or a small business owner or a founder, works very differently with different audiences and that we can alienate groups that we may want to engage simply by the words and terminology and placement and colors that we use. So there was an example of uh, Google, and they had a, 
a situation where when you looked, with, uh, looked at the word executive or CEO, you saw white males. Now that's not surprising. We know most Fortune 500 CEOs are white and male. Google is doing their job. This was a pretty accurate representation of what that looked like. But they thought about the implications of what happens when a young black girl is doing a school research report about what she wants to be when she grows up. And this is what she sees. And so Google went through a process called scrubbing to neutral, where they changed what you see. And if you look today on that very same search, you'll see mostly stock imagery of some women and minority executive looking people. But even this process of scrubbing to neutral is flawed. We're taking our own account of what neutral is. Who are we to say what neutral actually is? And we're dictating that for the rest of the world. So behind all of this machinery, there is a very human component. So we realized that you can't take into account only the experience of your existing user base. As I mentioned before at Alice, we user test 100% on women, minorities, and underserved population. And that is because that is the core audience of who we are trying to support, regardless of what percent of that population is actually on our platform. All of our user testing is done with those audiences. And we did this because we looked at a lot of other technology that supports entrepreneurs. And we found that most of these platforms were 80% or higher male. And this is, again, happened very organically. It happened because most of those founders tend to be male. They turned initially, like many of you with your businesses, to the people who they know to spread the word about what they were doing. And as those first user bases started to build, they tested against those user bases. And then it began to build, they began to build a product that worked for a very homogenous audience. And so it's really important as you start to think about building technology that you test within a very diverse audience. The other really important piece here is to consider where your data is coming from. In the case of Google, for example, their algorithms actually weren't flawed, but their data input, inputs weren't diverse. And so there are so many sources now already as you start looking at machine learning and AI where you can pull data from external third-party sources. But it's very important to understand where that data originally came from, what that data includes, and to ensure that you're putting the right inputs into your technology to create outputs that are diverse and inclusive. In, in the event that you aren't able to find that, it's, it's simple things like think about if you're looking for a data set from uh, university students. And you can quickly find you know, the top 10 universities and take data from those. If instead you were to look for the top 10 most diverse universities, your results will be different in subtle ways, but your outputs too will be very different. The other important consideration is to take into account non-technical expertise. Our product teams are traditionally composed of designers, of engineers, of product managers, people with very traditional technology expertise. But as we move forward in this new age of AI and machine learning, there are all sorts of other um, areas that are very, very relevant. Things like anthropology and gender studies and sociology and philosophy and linguistics. And when we build this technology, it's important to consider those aspects of what we are creating because they all have a very significant impact on the biases that we as founders implement into our technology, which then scales out to the millions and billions. So my challenge for all of you is to consider with your companies what are the data inputs that you're putting into your businesses? Not only is your own team diverse, but are the data sources that you're using and testing against diverse? Are the algorithms that you're creating being built for an inclusive audience? Are you testing against that inclusive audience? And how can you use the technology that you're building 
to change the world for the better, because I do think there are significant opportunities to take that data, to take that information, to scale it in the most impactful of ways. Thank you very much. Uh, it has been a true pleasure being here at Amsterdam. And uh, if you have any questions, I'll be hanging out behind after. Thank you. Carolyn Roth.